Bismillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, everybody. Thank you so much for joining, um, whether you are watching live or if you are um, here in the space. And so, uh, or if you're going to be watching this in the future, inshallah, peace be upon you. It's been a pleasure to be able to go through these last few weeks uh, on the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu And it's a pleasure to be able to come back live in the presence of friends and in the company of people such as yourself and live again. So Bismillah, let us go ahead and start. Last time in our fifth session, we covered the uh, battle, a number of things, um, primarily dealing with the Battle of Badr up until the Battle of Uhud. Uh, we talked about how the Battle of Badr came to play per se, how it came out to fruition, and specifically how it was the result of uh, the Muslims necessarily finding that agency, finding their own self-determination, but then also uh, in doing so, coming into conflict with Mecca. But per se, these were people who were exiled. These were people who were removed from their land. These people who were deprived of their property. And so finding uh, a way to reclaim that through miscellaneous raids, they were able to uh, reclaim some of those properties, but again, uh, came into conflict with the Quraysh and that manifested in the Battle of Badr. We talked about what the aftermath of that was like in places such as Mecca and Medina that had two completely opposite reactions. We talked about how uh, in, the, in the aftermath of this battle, there was also a number of uh, treacherous incidents that were occurring. There was also a looming kind of aura of treachery, not just limited to people who are not Muslim, the people who had professed that they were Muslim, but had not shown it per se outwardly, you know, behind the closed doors, they would express their dissent, but in, in the face, they would be at the mosque, they'd be praying right next to side by side. And we'll see their role start to manifest more so in today's session after Uhud, where we start our setting here in the aftermath of the Battle of Uhud. So we talked about last time, the Battle of Uhud, how the Meccans had formed another coalition had come back to Uhud and had come to uh, attack the Muslims per se. And the Muslims instead of, uh, had debated in terms of going to take the fight to the uh, Meccans outside of the city or to hold the city as a fort, decided to go out. And a number of factors occurred that resulted in the Muslims actually uh, being, uh, in, in terms of on the battlefield, uh, being routed in a way that 70 of their uh, fellow troops had had died, uh, whereas 22 of the Meccans had passed away. So we're going to examine the aftermath of this battle a little bit, and our hope is to get to the end of the Battle of the Trench. So inshallah, we'll be covering these two things, but we're not going to be spending too much time, as I mentioned, on the specific details of the battles. There's so many better sources that can give you the specific details of these battles. I want us to try and extract the humanistic elements from these. What, what, what was significant of these battles, but also in the in-betweens. A lot of times we'll just mark the prophet's life as a timeline and just have this battle occurred at this year, this battle occurred this year, but there's so much growth and development occurring for him, occurring for the community, occurring for people around that it's, it's really worthwhile to lift some of those narratives up. Um, so let's go ahead and start here. As we mentioned last time, the Battle of Uhud happened about 16 years after the revelation. So from the time in Mecca, when the Prophet ﷺ was first given revelation, about 16 years after that, three or so years after the migration from Mecca to Medina. So still a fairly nascent new community that is being formed in Medina, yet they've already now undergone two pretty serious battles. As we mentioned, about 70 Muslims were dead, uh, had been killed out of about 700. And we talked about how of these uh, Muslims who had passed away, 65 of them were native to Medina, who were the helpers, the Ansar. Four of them were the immigrants from Mecca, so the Muhajirun. And there's one at least explicit non-Muslim who was a Jew, uh, who had, I believe his name was Mukhairik, uh, who had not accepted Islam, but had, because of the pact that the Prophet that you'll recall we had discussed, and the pact that the Prophet ﷺ had formed with the various tribes, with the various contingencies of Medina, had felt that he was obligated to honor that because Medina was being uh, attacked. So he therefore went out and uh, was, uh, was on the battlefield with the Muslims and had uh, been martyred in that sense. There's also uh, very interesting narratives that come about, not just apart from the fact that 
there was heavy losses that occurred, but the quality of loss that occurred at Uhud was something very significant. There is a story of uh, Usairim. Usairim is a companion who had just embraced Islam that morning, and he had actually passed away during the battle. And so he, he uh, the, the Prophet ﷺ had commented on this person that there is one person right there who will be given paradise, but hadn't even prayed a single prayer. And so it, it shows that the different kind of qualities that were given to people such as that. We talked about another, uh, another person who had been given uh, martyrdom in the sense who had met martyrdom, but was a newlywed, uh, Handala. Handala had been newly married the night before and right the day after his wedding, uh, went out into the battlefield and embraced and was uh, was was taken. His life was taken. But it, it, there's powerful narratives beyond these statistics that are there. It's it's easy to say 70 had died out of 700, but each of these people have deep connections to one another, to their families. And so this is just a little bit of an insight there. We know on the Meccan side, about 22 Meccans passed away out of 3,000. So the Muslims had, at least from reports here, about a three to one uh, four to one type of disadvantage. And so uh, the Meccans also suffered some losses, but clearly it was a bit more disproportionate on the Muslims end. In the aftermath of this battle, we know that the Prophet ﷺ was badly wounded. He had uh, incurred different types of bodily injuries that his helmet had pierced his cheek. He had lost uh, some teeth. Um, he had uh, some lacerations, so he was he was also uh, incapacitated in some in some cases. And so, uh, while the Muslims had taken refuge on a bit of a hill or a part of the mountain there, the Meccans went about to uh, claim their dead, to bury their dead, but also in a in a fit of revenge, in a fit of pre-Islamic uh, jahiliyyah, in, in in a custom that is not limited specifically to that culture by any means. They went about and. Uh, mutilated the Muslims that they identified. So uh, most famous among them, of course, was Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, who was uh, badly mutilated to the point to where the Prophet ﷺ, after the Meccans had left, had seen what had happened to not just Hamza, but so many other Muslims who were terribly mutilated, had vowed not just revenge, but also vowed to mutilate 30 other uh, Meccans in response. And there was a quick correction that was given to the Prophet ﷺ at this moment of true lament, at this moment of true humanity. You can sense that this was one of the Prophet's closest protectors from the onset. We recall Hamza was someone that stood up for the Prophet ﷺ when he was literally being beaten in public. And the Prophet ﷺ had a very deep tie with Hamza, not as much as an uncle to a nephew, but more like a brother because they're similar in age. And so uh, Hamza's death had caused these emotions to rush. But of course, there was a correction that came down to the Prophet ﷺ in, in Revelation that had instructed that mutilation is not the way of Muslims. The mutilation is not the way in battle, after battle, any place like that. And so the, uh, the concept of war, the concept of human dignity was laid down even in, a, even in an emotional event like that. But just imagine what the Prophet ﷺ might have been feeling, and he had a feel. He had these moments of really raw humanity when he saw what had been resulted of his uncle. And reports vary in terms of the degree of mutilation, but it's generally understood that it was to such a severe degree that he had uh, resulted in claiming revenge or wanting to to claim revenge. But we see that uh, that lament had been uh, addressed. We also see when the Prophet Sallam goes to bury the Muslim dead, how difficult this must have been and especially from the lens of trauma and from the lens of loss, the Prophet ﷺ makes, uh, gives out another lament that said, would, would that I had been left abandoned with my companions at the mountain's foot or at the foot of the mountain. He relates this incident where during this battle, it was the, the situation was looking quite bleak and he was surrounded by essentially a contingent of the Meccan army, but surrounded by just a few of his more passionate supporters and things had looked bleak that they were going to uh, finish him off. And so he had lament that rather than kind of doing this, had I just got perished in battle with regards to these other folks. And so you see the emotional toll and having to do this 70 times, having to read a funeral prayer for each of these people 70 times going through that, 
uh, and imagining what what is that what did that feel like because these were people as as we broke down four of them were people who migrated with him who he knew for several years before this this incident and there were 65 of them who had opened their homes who had opened their city for them to take refuge and there was one person who didn't even have a uh, a a specific horse in the race but because of a pact had decided to honor that pact and you see the prophet of having to deal with not just loss with his relatives but loss with some of his closest companions and confidants that were there we see as well that the Prophet ﷺ, as I mentioned, was not just physically injured, but morally injured as well. He was psychologically injured, and we see the impact of Hamza's death go on for the rest of his life. It's related that the person who had killed Hamza, Wahshi, had uh, later in life when coming to seek the forgiveness of the Prophet, the Prophet ﷺ had asked him to recount, first and foremost, tell him how he had killed Hamza, just because it seems like there was some unsettled uh, trauma, there was some unsettled type of feeling that the process some just needed to know there's some of these incidents that happen in our lives where we feel that we just need to know it might be a very terrible very uh, difficult memory for us but sometimes we just need that resolution we just need that resolve and the process some had asked Wahshi to give him that and after giving him that the process some was quite emotional some reports say that he had told Wahshi to uh, just go on and he didn't want to see Washi's face again. And so you you see that, you know, he he had he had still been a Muslim, but you see the impact that uh, this death had lasted for the rest of uh, the Prophet Sam's life. We also see in the Muslim community as a whole, similar to how Hind, the wife of Abu Sufyan on the Meccan side, last time we talked about at Badr, how she lost her brother, her uncle, and her father. We also talk about this time how uh, Hamana binti Jash, she's, I believe, a cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, she lost her husband, she lost her brother, and she lost her uncle in a single day as well. This uh, battle and these battles themselves are evident that loss does not specifically relate to just one specific uh, ideology or group, that there are multiple types of loss, not just being felt by communities on both sides, but because of how these societies are and how intertwined they are, you see how uh, connected these losses are. You lose somebody in battle, they are bound to be connected by at least two or three degrees to someone else on that battlefield. And if not there, then at home. So you see how deep these wounds go as a part to just, oh, this person had passed away. No, when they had been lost, when a husband and a brother and an uncle were lost, those are three different households, but then that's also one household. So Ohud and Badr in their aftermath teach us about at the time that these battles were not just two foreign armies coming together. These were relatives, these were neighbors, these were people who had known each other, but also when, uh, because of the nature of the battle, because of the fact that this was before technology, this was at the time of swords and bows and arrows, that the types of wounds that were inflicted were quite graphic and people were there on the spot at the time to identify these bodies, to bury them. So you can think about what it's like to lose multiple members of your family at that instant. The, these battles should give us that. But but in uh, what we, we talked about as well is that time and time again for the early Muslim community and as a result for us as well, the Quran was not just a source of guidance per se, in a sense that this is the law, this is what the Quran says. The Quran met the people where they were, met the Muslims when they were grieving, met them when they were succeeding, met them when they, their hearts were wavering. And at this time, comfort came from the Quran. Surah Al-Baqarah tells us the famous verse in which uh, it, it states how those who are killed in the path of Allah speak of not that they are dead, but speak of them because they are, uh, they are alive. And so we see that the revelation at this time and the revelation was not just something isolated to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ would just convey random musings to people. The Prophet ﷺ conveyed things that were very relevant and very uh, very on point to the pulse of the community. And so when we look at that to our state today, when we look at that to our community now, we can approach the Quran as a holy text that approached people directly, that met people where they were. And for us, separated by however many centuries and however many uh, decades and millennia, we still approach this text as a way that meets us where we are because it is a divine text. But we see the Quran approaching these people not in a way that just gives them straight law or just says this is right, this is wrong, but approaches them in, in a way of comfort. And that's uh, the Quran is, is, is called a shifa, it's called a healing. And uh, the 
uh, famous uh, jurist Gadi Iyad had named the biography of the Prophet the healing, as shifa and his, his, his book about the Prophet had, had titled it as such. And so we find in the example of the Prophet in the moments of revelation, in the occasions for revelation, the asbab al-nuzul, we find that these are moments of healing, not just for the people at that time, but they can be for us as well. And so in the aftermath of this battle, we mentioned 70 people passed away. We see that just tangibly, there's a loss of so many husbands, so many uh, uh, widows that are now made, so many orphans. And so it, it brings about as well the other revelation that deals with uh, permission to marry more than one uh, wife, permission to marry up to four. Karen Armstrong comments that this is not this was not done as a way just to satisfy uh, men's sexual appetites at the time. Rather, it, if you look at the context of it, if you look at who was uh, it being given permission to, and you look at the setting, you see that this was to take care of people who had become just the most marginalized of society, the people who were recently widowed, the people who were recently orphaned, that these people would not be subject to being exploited or taken advantage of. Many of those men who had passed away had property. Many of those men who passed away had other types of business and whatnot. And so when they passed away, it was assumed that uh, it, it, these people could fall into the margins to where they would be taken advantage of. And so we see that this is a society of scarcity and that the Quran addressed the society where it was not to just make a, a type of social claim that, that later on in modernity, we look back and we're like, oh, Muslims just do this or do that, but address the community where it was about to be hurting quite a bit. And so in a way to give shelter to the widow, to give shelter to the orphan, which has been a consistent theme of Islam since day one, we see this being tangibly into implemented here. And so we see in the aftermath of the battle, there are uh, there are different skirmishes that occur. The the Muslims chase uh, want to chase the Quraysh out of the area. Of course, this is a heavily heavy contingent um, that, upon leaving, tells the Prophet Sallam, tells the other Muslims that, "Hey, next year in Badr, we got one. You got one the first time. We got one this time. We'll see you again." Uh, again. So so they had. Uh, had undergone this as a way of just saying that, hey, we just even the score, but the business is not done yet. So they had been kind of chased out per se, but in the evaluation of this battle, do we look at it as a explicit defeat? Well, we look at it from the goal of the Quraysh. The goal of the Quraysh was essentially to uh, wipe out the Muslim community or at the least to kill the prophet to just, uh, to just finish things off like that. But we know that this was not accomplished. And hence, when the Quraysh are leaving, they give a signal of a tit for tat that the first time you won, this time we won, next year we'll settle the score at Badr. And so you see that, the, the, that it was it maybe an explicit defeat? The Muslims probably took more losses, but in terms of a clear cut L, did the Muslims take that? It's, it's hard to, uh, to explicitly say because from a goal standpoint, that wasn't the case. But if you look at it just from a loss standpoint, that might be how you evaluate it. But we look at the battle and uh, its context from a wider range. Now, in the aftermath of that, we see that the Muslims are visibly rattled and shaken. Obviously, they, you know, this is, they're upon the truth. They're, they believe that they're upon the truth. And so they see that they're uh, not just rattled and shaken, but they're confused and they continue to be disparaged by people who are in Mecca or sorry, in Medina who don't agree with them. People who are the hypocrites, people who are of other tribes, they start to say different things like, hey, if, if uh, this Muhammad person was a true prophet, why would y'all lose? Why would this happen? Why would that happen? And so we see these feelings of treachery, this animosity starts to boil up and the Quran starts to address this as well. The Quran, especially in Surah Ali Imran, starts to talk about how there is a distinction between those who believe sincerely, as well as those who say that they believe, but in the background uh, say that we don't believe, that, that, that it's just a front for them. So we start to see this boiling up, and we're actually going to cover that in the next session. But we start to see this concept of uh, nifaq, this concept of hypocrisy, rise within the community specifically amongst individuals who had accepted Islam because it's a political move, but now because they had just one foot in the boat when they had accepted, they are more, uh, more you know, uh, wanting to just give their, their 10 cents when, when things aren't going the Muslims way. But at the end of the day, we see that Uhud was at the least a test of faith. Belief is not always guaranteed sunny days. It's not something that always guarantees a positive outcome. We see that even after this disaster, the Prophet was not like, okay, hey, 
this mistake was made because I gave an instruction. That instruction was disobeyed. We talked about the archers abandoning their post. This, uh, this disaster occurred because I wanted to go ahead and stay in the city, but you all wanted to go out and fight these people in the field. And that happened. You see, you see none of this. The Prophet doesn't consolidate any of this. The Prophet still continues to take consultation and take advice from the people around him. And we start to see not just this play out in the future battles and the future relations he has with his community, but we see how that uh, comments on his psychology, how that comments on him as a person. You would think that someone who is just after power, someone who is just power hungry or wanting to consolidate or doing all these things would clearly take the initiative to just say, hey, you guys are like way off your mark in terms of wanting to do things. Uh, let me go ahead and just run the ship. I'm going to do it. We're going to take uh, take control. And many of us are susceptible to that. We see our coworkers, we see people in our families and teams make a mistake and we're like, hey, you know, forget it. We'll just do it. We'll just take care of it. And the process of didn't do that. He didn't do that. He forgave those who on the battlefield had made a mistake, those who had ran away because they saw the situation was quite dire. Uh, and he also forgave that those who uh, had had deliberately, you know, challenged his his initial thoughts of where the battle should take place, and so we see the Prophet standing on this ground of faith and not on one that just asserts his own authoritativeness. And so it's important to see the Prophet not swaying from taking consultation because this will play a pivotal role, especially in the trench as we get there. So. In the aftermath as well, uh, we now move on to after the Battle of Ohud, there's a series of different skirmishes and raids. Of course, it, I'll try and share a image in the WhatsApp chat of what the map of Arabia looked like from a coalition standpoint. And at that time after Ohud, you will see that the Muslims have their oasis in Medina. They have tribes and alliances along where Badr was, along the coast uh, where the Red Sea is. But the whole rest of that patch, the whole middle of this, uh, of this Arabian Peninsula is essentially a building coalition of different tribes of the Quraysh, of their confederates that are starting to close in and they are hostile. So the uh, Prophet Sallam, in, in the sense of sensing this growing hostility wants to make sure that people know that they are not able to just come and make a raid on Medina. So he issues different types of raids to be sure they, they demarcate that Medina is not to be messed with, that you can't just come just because the Quraysh came and now you can also do that. There's a obvious landscape of hostility, but we see some very notable things come about in these raids, not just in the fact that, hey, these raids occurred, but within them, we see that uh, these retaliation efforts that are done by the hostiles to the Muslims result in imprisonment of some very key Muslims, some uh, Muslims by the name of Khubayb and Zayd ibn uh, Dathina, that uh, these two uh, individuals are taken hostage. And it's so important to see that from their example, the level of faith that was instilled, because there's a comment that's made by the Quraysh that really tells us what the level of faith was like at this time for these people. So these two individuals were tortured. They were pressed to defect. They were saying, hey, just say something bad about Muhammad. Just say, just do something bad. Just tell us that you're not with him. We'll let you go. And they say to the extent that even if a thorn was to prick the Prophet Sallam, that uh, we would not even want to permit ourselves that, that we cannot let ourselves do something like that. And so before they are executed, they asked to do the two cycles of two cycles of prayer, just two rakah of prayer before their death. And so seeing how this, uh, we'll talk about how prayer factors into these very tense situations, but the Quraysh commented upon their execution that uh, no father loved their son so much as the companions of Muhammad love Muhammad. And so it's a really important commentary for us when we look back at these names, at people, at stats, that there's a reason that they, uh, you know, beyond the fact that their their memory lives on. It's, it's also because they had put their faith and everything that they believed and held true in not just the prophet, but also in the message that the prophet conveyed. So, you know, we, we'll talk about how easy it could have been to defect, how easy it could have been to just say, I don't believe, or I believe for the sake of saving lives, but we see how crucial it was in the pre-Islamic time to have a conviction for something of faith, to have a conviction of some kind of belief. And the way these people held on to that belief, it shows you that there was definitely an element of sincerity that wouldn't let them waver. And so we see uh, from their examples that there's so much 
to be learned and so much to be appreciated and oftentimes in ways that just gets brushed to the side that, oh, these people were martyrs, they, uh, and they were uh, promised paradise, things like that, and let's get back to the Prophet No, we see how the Prophet impacted people, impacted them to the way that even at the point of death, all they had asked for was one, to be given time to give in prayer, and then two, that uh, no harm uh, will ever come from them to the Prophet so we see as well uh, in, in these going on raids and these skirmishes, one of the uh, tragedies that occurred was a ambush at Bir Mauna. Bir Mauna was a place where the Prophet had, uh, he had pr prior had been married to uh, his wife Zainab binti Khuzayma. Zainab binti Khuzayma was of the tribe of Bani Amr. And just a quick note on Zainab, she was a widow. She was a widow. She was uh, one of the Prophet's wives who uh, was also known as the mother of the poor for her devotion to the people of the poor, people who were uh, the orphans, people who were poor, that that was just who she was known as, was someone that was there, but she was also an older person. So you see when people critique the Prophet Sallam in terms of that he's just marrying people left and right. He's, he's obviously just you know doing this because he has this uh, un, unsatiable desire for women. You see the types of people he is marrying. These people are bringing community benefit. And these are people who are widowed. These are people who wouldn't be looked at twice in our society and it, let alone in that society as someone who you can marry, someone who's older, someone who's in their forties and has kids and other things like that. And so we see from this, the Prophet not just uh, marrying for the sake of marrying, but marrying because of the fact that it, it institutionalizes elements of good. It institutionalizes elements of giving to the poor. Now you have one of the mothers of the believer who is known as a mother of the poor. You, you incorporate that social doctrine in. So going back to the concept, uh, the, the aspect of the ambush of Be'er Mauna, the tribe that Zainab is from is the Bani Amir. Their chieftain invites the Prophet Sallallahu to teach his people, to teach the clan, and the Prophet Sallallahu sends 40 people to go teach Islam to them, but they are ambushed by a neighboring tribe, and 38 of them are killed. One of those survivors is able to get out, sees two people from the tribe that Zainab is from, and kills those people and says that they, they ambushed us. You know, we went to their land, they ambushed us. He didn't know that they were killed by a different tribe. And the Prophet, we see his concept of justice here that even though this had occurred, the Prophet still had insisted on the custom of the time of blood money to being paid to the tribe that hadn't touched the Prophet's. Uh, people hadn't even killed anybody, but they were killed uh, in, in, in a sort of retaliation. And the Prophet ﷺ had insisted on that blood money being paid. What this, what significance uh, this event had was that this occasion had led to another uncovering of some more treachery. We're going to get to that in a second. But we see that in the, in the aspects of how uh, these, these different skirmishes, these different ambushes sometimes are just listed as expeditions or raids or sometimes commented on by people that the Prophet just had a hunger or a thirst for wanting revenge or wanting all these things. We see that these, these things weren't done for those sake. We see that uh, if you look at the map of where Muslims were, they were kind of on an island being pinched and uh, being, being closed in on. And so you set boundaries per se, you set those boundaries in the ways that, that are proper, but then also you look in deeper to these expeditions. Some of them weren't expeditions at all. Some of them were just like this. These were literally like a missionary mission. This is like uh, the equivalent of a group of missionaries going and being just uh, completely slaughtered for the, for the fact of just going there. And so the type of outrage that we see play out is oftentimes Times selective, especially from the lens that we see it played from. But it's important to see that the Muslims, when they were settling in Medina, were not just sending out random raids or just like, you know, poking poking the bear from different directions. They were working with the tribes that were around them and working in such a way that uh, helped establish the community. But the response as always, as when you're surrounded by such a cluster can probably not always be what you're expecting. And in this case, they had encountered a bit of a massacre. And so what had then resulted was the, uh, we talked about that there were three preeminent uh, Jewish tribes that were in uh, the precincts of Medina. You had the uh, Banu Kainuqa, we had the Banu Nadir, and we had the Banu Quraiza. We talked about last time how the Banu uh, Kainuqa after the, after the Battle of Badr had been expelled due to uh, some incidents of treachery due to 
uh, some incidents of uh, treason, blatant treason. The Banu Nadir now were another tribe that were more or less very hesitant and very kind of opposing to the prophet on face value. They, they, they didn't, they may have been very uh, placating at first, but they didn't really resonate with what he had to say apart from just treaties. And so the, they were in allyship with the tribe that the Prophet ﷺ was going to play, pay blood money to, who had just uh, had two of their people killed by one of the Prophet ﷺ's men. And so the Prophet ﷺ had approached them as a part of their treaty that, hey, this just this whole incident just happened. Can you help us pay for the blood money because you are uh, related with these people? You you have a tie with them. Can we uh, share this blood money to be paid? Because a, a blood money is not anything very very insignificant. It's very significant, especially given the type of people that were killed. So it's 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 definitely something that uh, was not a cheap expense by any means. And so uh, the Prophet Sallam goes request their assistance in helping, but uh, he comes to know of, uh, we don't know the specific details, different different accounts are given, but essentially he has come to know of a assassination attempt that will be taken place to him uh, that he avoids. And so again, we have another instance of treason. The Prophet some didn't go to these folks and saying, hey, uh, you know, we, we need some more space. We need some real estate. Just go ahead and get out of here. The Prophet some went to as a way of community building to be able to go and uh, to, to be able to deal with something that the community had had uh, come come upon. And so when this was not met with the type of response that was expected at all, uh, the Prophet ﷺ had given the order for them to being uh, expelled. So they, they were to be ex exiled, but uh, they were allowed to take their uh, property that anything that they could carry on a camel's back with them. Uh, and there are other uh, of their coalition tribes that they were welcome to go to. But he had in this in this account, it's very interesting to note, because it tells you that we, we oftentimes give a very romanticized portrait of the Prophet as uh, this was, uh, you know, the Prophet was, was just this or just that. Uh, he had to make difficult decisions. This was one of them because this was a 10 day siege that was laid at these people's fortresses. And it's very interesting if you go after this class, I'll, post, I'll actually post a link uh, in our WhatsApp chat. But if you type in uh, the you know fortresses Saudi Arabia, or if you type in fortresses Arabia, Jewish fortresses Arabia, a lot of these fortresses, these, these stone fortresses are still there. They're still preserved there because nobody really knows what to do with them or, or goes to them. They're just, they're just built upon mountains and stuff. So you get an idea of what these fortifications look like. When I tell you that they were in fortis, fortresses, it might contrast with the image of a desert that you have in your mind, but these areas were actually quite hilly. They were rocky, they were mountainy, they were, this was an oasis. And so you, you are able to get a concept of what it looked like in that time uh, when I say fortress and when, when someone was besieged. So the Prophet Sallam at this time did something that he had never done before, and I don't believe he did it again. But uh, in order to finally get them to capitulate, there were they had a an orchard of palms, and he had issued uh, an order to cut down some of these palm trees uh, to basically get them to capitulate, which they finally did because palm trees take a long time to grow. They also are very prized because of the the dates they produce, so it's a source of wealth. And so they had. Uh, at, told him, hey, don't cut it down because from their perspective, it was that, okay, we'll just, we'll go with whatever is told to us. We'll come back to Medina and we'll get we'll get our date palms back. We'll, we'll basically reclaim this area. So for them, they, they capitulated at the onset of a few of those trees being cut. He, uh, he, he was able to exile them, but they, this, this was not a score that was settled. So whenever we read these narratives, it's also important to not just look at it from a one-sided lens. When I look at this narrative, it's not just from the Muslims and the Muslims dealing with these people and only considering what the Muslims are experiencing. Think about the other side too, because it helps to understand why they might do the things they might do. Uh, obviously we might uh, decide to go with one side of the narrative or the other, but it at least makes a little bit more sense to us when we think about why did they choose to come and fight back? Why did they maybe go and get in cahoots with the Quraysh? Why did they show back up to fight uh, Medina? Why did they commit tre treachery? Sometimes it's about land. Sometimes it's about property. Sometimes it's about uh, one's feeling that uh, they are being encroached upon, different things like that. So it's important for us to not to dehumanize any of the people, even if they are set a certain way written off by Muslim history, even if they are written off and even castigated per se within the sacred uh, texts in the 
Quran, if they are if they are singled out, it's still important to lift up uh, the their human psychology as a way to kind of understand why they do the things they do. It may not be what we agree with, but it's something that helps us to see why they might have done the things they do. So we see that when they were expelled, not only were, were their palms, uh, their orchard palms, something that was left, they were also one of the tribes that was in charge of the marketplace that was taken from them. Their land was given to those who had been refugees, those who were on the margins, that was given to them. So now when they are outside of Medina, when they are uh, settled in Khaybar, where they, where they find some respite, they, the, the psychology of revenge starts to percolate. And so now you start to think, uh, did, did, were they thinking about what uh, their actions had uh, brought about or were they thinking more so that this was our stuff and we're going to get it back? So you think about that psychology of revenge that plays in. But going back to this last point real quick, that this land was allocated to the immigrants. We had talked about in previous sessions how the Medinans uh, were primarily farmers, were primarily people who were agricultural. People from Mecca were primarily traders. They're people who are market uh, specialists. And so when they came to, to Medina, it was hard to find opportunity and autonomy, economic independence for them. And so this land, this marketplace was an opening for them to finally get some agency because they were left behind. They were those who became on the margins. And so this uh, this expulsion per se, this, this removal had some benefits as well for those who were most marginalized. So now uh, taking a slight tangent from the concept of battle, from the concept of skirmishes, we see that in Medina, we start to have the building of a community. We start to see the prophet, not just as someone who is at war, you see the prophet as a messenger, as a statesman, as a commander, as a husband, as a father, grandfather, and a teacher and a friend. You see all these different roles start to play out for the Prophet ﷺ. And so we see as well the role of women, how the Prophet ﷺ in his coming helps to boost and improve the role of women within the society. We see a comment uh, that has been given concerning one of the companions complaining to the Prophet that the women of Mecca, who are a bit more reserved, who would not talk back to their husbands, um, versus the women of Medina who would be who would talk back to their husbands who would who would be very strong women we see the companions complain that uh, why is this the case and the prophet sallam tells them how his wives basically do the same that they 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 talk back to him as well so you see the prophet sallam normalizing things that previously in a certain society were seen that this is not okay like women should be completely subservient to us and the prophet sallam meeting that with laughter and saying that, no, like, you know, my, my wives talk back to me and they give me a hard time too. They, they're, that's okay. Whereas where they came from, that might've been seen as crossing the line. That would have been seen as the man uh, taking the uh, taking the action of maybe correcting that uh, uh, his wife in, 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 in their interpretation. So you see people using uh, physical abuse, you see people using these different means, hitting their women and whatnot, but you never see that from the Prophet ﷺ. And in fact, you see the Prophet ﷺ giving space for his wives, giving space for people in his home to complain to him, to give him this issue, whereas in the, in the other sense, this was not the case. We see property rights, we see divorce rights, we see a limitation on the number of wives. So we also see not just the fact that four wives are put in, sometimes people will see that, oh, that you know, Muslims are given all these wives to marry, but you also look at the context that it's also limiting because we know that in pre-Islamic society, women weren't given a right to divorce. Women were not given even basic property rights. And so uh, they were also not given a specific limit. So husbands could marry and divorce at will. Islam kind of came and sacralized marriage, sacralized the institution of marriage and made divorce a bit more taboo in a sense that there's a more of a commitment to a marriage than uh, just wanting to feel like you're, you're gratified sexually or you're just gratified for that sense. So Islam really came and sacralized marriage, but did it in a way that was not to push one gender to the other side and one gender to the other side. It, it was there uh, done in a way to give space to both. And so Apart from that, we see the Prophet's family life that it really blossomed during this time. And we have a lot of rich accounts of how the Prophet would spend his day, how he would interact with the people. It's related that he split his day into thirds, that a third of his day was spent with his family, a third of his day was spent for work, and the other third was spent for prayer. And how these, these thirds would look uh, tangibly played out 
he had grandkids that he would play with. He would go and have them, you know, climb on his back, or he would just like, uh, you know, play like horse with them or whatnot. And they, they, they climb on his back and he's, he's, he's laughing with them. He's playing with them. He takes time to visit his friends and his families and his children. He takes time to uh, not just only uh, give time to them, but then also to the people who aren't even his family. So giving time to his friends like Abu Bakr. We see that uh, a comment is made that one cannot remember and be close to God and not have or show generosity and human attention. So the Prophet in this time really gives us an example that uh, you know faith and practicing Islam truly is not just confining ourselves to one space, removing ourselves from our family and just immersing ourselves in just the faith or just to prayer or anything like that, uh, a vibrant, uh, Islam, a vibrant practice of faith is done in vibrancy with your community, is done in vibrancy with your family, with family, work, and prayer. So it's a balance of all these. It's not a exclusion of any of these. We see, as I mentioned, his grandkids, who he was very fond of, of Hussein and Hassan. Uh, his, his, we, we see that in his relationship with his daughter, we talk about the relationship of how, uh, or the, the role of women being given uh, more honor. We see how in, in his relationship with his daughter, Fatima, anytime she would come to visit the Prophet he would be sitting down and as soon as she comes in, he stands up for her. If anytime he was there, he would stand up for her and he would give his place of seating to her, the, the type of honor that is bestowed there. And he really modeled that, not just for, hey, this is just for Fatima, but this is something that people would see, people observe when they see the Prophet stand up for his daughter. In a society where some tribes used to bury their daughters, he would stand up for his daughter and he would give her that honor of coming in. So you see him reversing the psychology of superiority or patriarchy and start to uh, really dismantle it in ways that not just were uh, just institutionalized, but in a way that he modeled it himself. It could have been easy for him to say, hey, treat women with respect, let them do this. But it's another thing for him to take that step forward and to really practice it out. Uh, we see as well in his marriages that uh, it, it, he, he has given the permission to marry more than four, but again, it's not in the in the lens of people him, him just marrying because he has this unsatiable desire to get married. The people who he marries are all widows, with the exception of Aisha. That all of them are widows. We see that uh, his 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 wives are those who are uh, have different diplomatic relations, if not within the community, but to other people as well. Uh, notably, the people he marries at this time, at this time, are Hafsa, the daughter of Omar, so one of his closest friends. Um, he also married Aisha before that, who is the daughter of Abu Bakr, another close friend. He marries his cousin, Zainab binti Jash, and he marries Umm Salama, who is the wife of his cousin, Abu Salama, um, who becomes, in her own way, a bit of a spokesperson. She has her own story that can be told about her and her own uh, really rich narrative, but just a, 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 a bit of uh, a comment on her. When we talk about the role of women, we see Umm Salama was one of those people who in the middle of the mosque, when uh, the Prophet is giving a sermon or giving an address, she stands up and she asks, she says, Prophet why doesn't the Quran talk to us as women? Like, why does it only talk to men? And the revelation coming in response in Surah Az-Zahab, talking specifically addressing believing men, believing women, pious men, pious women, addressing them as such. But we see again, this element of not just a responsive revelation and a responsive Quran, but we also see the agency of women. The Prophet ﷺ, how many mosques can you think of where, uh, especially in more conservative circles, conservative countries, where a woman can go and just start talking to the uh, Imam and just saying something and just saying that, hey, this is this is what we feel, this is what's there. It would, it would seem, that they would not have a, a much space to be listened to. They, they might not even be allowed to come back to the mosque, sadly. Uh, and we see the space that the Prophet gave for people in this mosque. And this, this, type of, uh, this type of space would continue into the caliphates of the people coming after the Prophet We see in the time of Omar, a woman as well stood up uh, when the question of dowries had come up and had corrected him and he had said the woman has spoken well and I've spoken wrong. And so you see this space was given in a time 1400 years earlier and now we, we are at a discord where it comes to a time where it's like, should women be given this agency? Can women speak in the mosque? Can they do this? And you see how different it was in this time. And so we again 
talk about the psychology of the Prophet so I'm not just institutionalizing things and saying, hey, Allah says this, but practically showing them by their example that when his wife stands up and says something to him, um, you know, and he listens and he says that, uh, you know, that uh, your, your concern has been noted and then uh, a Quran comes out in response to her. So at this time as well, another sad occasion occurs. Uh, we talked about the Prophet as a human being going through multiple laws, uh, having to bury his children. We talked about just a few months earlier how he had to bury his daughter Ruqayya, who during the Battle of Badr had passed away and he had to bury her along with uh, his fellow members of the family were there. So this was a very uh, you know, very uh, grieving event, but also his uh, wife that he had married eight months earlier, Zainab binti Khuzayma. Uh, we talked about her just a little bit, that she died within eight months. So think about all these losses that the Prophet ﷺ is taking on and having to deal with the people who he's burying. These people are his wives. These people are his children. Every single generation you can think of, his uncle, his cousins, everybody that's coming there, he's experiencing a holistic type of loss that uh, most people don't experience in the span of their lives. And so we think about what he's experiencing in the span of just a few years, a few months. So apart from this, we see his relationship with the community. We talked about how the Prophet ﷺ had a, a very strong relationship with his uh, with his family, with the community as well. There's, a, there's several incidents or a couple incidents here in which a Muslim would go harass a Jewish person, would, would go harass a Jewish person in the market. One of these incidents was where the Muslim person had uh, harassed the Jewish person for saying, uh, taking an oath on the name of Moses. And that per that Muslim had said that, why are you taking Moses' name when uh, the Prophet ﷺ has been given to us, implying that the Prophet ﷺ was better than Moses. And the Prophet ﷺ had a very strong rebuke for this Muslim saying that, uh, you know, the that Quran and Allah tell us that uh, we, we shouldn't say that, you know, the prophets are all uh, respected in their own way. And that uh, in the Quran, it said specifically how uh, Moses as well as the family of Moses have been lifted above all of creation. And so we see these different honors given, but we see the Prophet ﷺ criticizing this type of, uh, this type of uh, supremacy within uh, one's faith, especially within interfaith relations. And so where the process of could have said, hey, yeah, you know, he's right. Our message is new. Yours is old. He says, don't say that. Don't say that at all. That's not that's not the case. And he takes the side of the Jewish person. What does that tell us about interfaith relations today and how we can, uh, can, can uh, conduct them? We also look at how the process of was very keen on not putting through compulsion on any of these people. There's there's not just these three main Jewish tribes that are there. We talked about how there's over 20 different Jewish tribes or contingencies that might be there. The Prophet ﷺ's revelation was not one that just said that you must convert by this time, otherwise everything's done. The Prophet ﷺ's revelation had said, come, come to uh, come learn from us, come, come talk to us, come share. So it was a very hand extended type of approach rather than uh, attacking these people and saying that you're, you're on the falsehood and we're on truth. So it's a very different way when we think about the societies where Islam is flourishing today and the approach they have to people of different faith, the practicing of different faith, the practicing of even minority uh, expressions within Islam, how those are prohibited. And we think about how the Prophet Sallallahu had conducted his manner within his own village, within his own small city of Medina, that there were people who were Jewish, there were people who were Christian, there were people of other faiths that were coming along and uh, were participating in the, in the vibrancy of the community. And never once did he go and say, okay, this is the deadline, you have to convert. So we think about the psychology that's there. The last thing I'll say before we dive into the Battle of the Trench, and inshallah, we'll wrap up at the Battle of the Trench there, but one example is how he was not just cordial with as I mentioned, his family and with other people, but also specific companions and the, the companions where they were. A specific story I want to lift up is the story of Jabir. Jabir ibn Abdullah was a someone who was orphaned. His father had died at Uhud. He was too young to participate in Uhud, but his father had told him intentionally stay behind um, to, to uh, stay behind here and take care of your seven sisters. So he has seven sisters, he has a mom, he has all these people to take care of. And uh, he, he's, he's returning from an expedition with the Prophet and he's already an orphan, he's economically at the margins. The Prophet sees that his camel is really old and it's just not going all, it's not going uh, as fast as anything else. And so the Prophet 
offers to buy the camel from him. It's a beautiful story that the Prophet Sallam barters with him, buys the camel from him, and then when, uh, you know, talks to him about his his personal life. The Prophet Sallam says like, hey, so, uh, you know, what, what's your, are, are you married? Like, you know, what, what, what's going on with you? And he was like, yeah, I'm married. And he said, who did you marry? Did you marry like uh, someone your age or did you marry an older person implying a widow? And Jabir said, I married a widow. And he said, why? Uh, and he said, because, you know, I have seven sisters, and I needed someone to help me take care of them. And the Prophet said, you, you chose very wisely. And he was like, you know what, I'll, I'll buy this camel from you. Let's just go to, to Medina, and we'll take care of it there. But the beautiful uh, in, instance in this was that the Prophet gave him the impression he was going to buy this camel for a certain amount. And then when they had gone to the mosque, they had taken care of everything, the Prophet said, hey, here's your camel, here's your money, keep both of them. Um, and so you just see how the process I'm related to someone who's essentially a stranger, someone who is just a, a companion that didn't have a direct uh, familial tie per se, but how he treated someone who clearly needed help. And this was not exclusive to Jabir. We'll talk in future how the process I'm related this way to so many people who were just in need. And through his example showed how important it was to not just know your Muslim uh, relative, your Muslim brother and sister, just to be able to be aware of their situation, but to being able to open to help them. Um, and so his example gives us that. The last thing we'll cover here, inshallah, and I'll try to get this through this in a manner that we can touch on it Latin next time, but uh, the battle of the trench. I want to cover this because not so much of the fact that it's a battle, but because of the way that this this whole event takes place and is a communal effort. So the battle in and of itself, there's not really even a battle. There's a few skirmishes that occur here and there, but what's worthwhile talking about is how the community came together in the aftermath of all these different things that are occurring and to unite a front. So the most significant parts of this incident of the Battle of the Trench or Khandak are actually not related to battle at all, are the concept of community. So just a quick fast, uh, some quick fast facts on the Battle of the Trench. It occurred 18 years after the revelation, which was two years after the Battle of Ohud. So two years after Ohud, which was three years after them coming to Medina. So now five years into uh, Medina, still very young. They, they've, they, uh, they haven't been in Medina as long as they've been in Mecca as a Muslim community. And so they're still growing. They're still interacting with people, but they're, uh, they're still a nascent community. We see the Quraysh uh, who are uh, a coalition on this end have, dealt, have been dealing with a loss at Badr at the first year after the Hijra, that they got some kind of a, a win at Uhud, but not what they had hoped to gain. And they hadn't shown up for the second round of Badr that they had promised for. So there's a lot of humiliation that's going around. And right now is the chance that they are given to strike. They're given an imperative to strike, especially because the Prophet ﷺ had just earlier expelled a tribe of uh, a, a Jewish coalition that had uh, that I had mentioned, you know, intended to come back and said, hey, we're going to get our trees back. We're going to get our land back. And this tribe, the Banu Nadir, had come down to Mecca and said, hey, we've got uh, a coalition. We've got confederates that are aligned with us in the north. You've got a confederacy here in the south. Let's. We, we've got enough troops. Let's take them out now. Now, now's our chance to strike. And the uh, Banu Nadir also said that, hey, we have one more tribe that is aligned with us, referring to the Banu Quraiza. We have another tribe that's aligned with us within within Medina. So if you come with us, if you join with us, we can take out Muhammad. We can take out the Muslim community. This is our chance now. And so. Uh, Surah Ahzab, Surah Al Ahzab takes its name from this coming together, this coalition, this confederacy. And so a coalition is assembled. Uh, some reports give up to almost 10,000 soldiers. And it's very interesting that. In each of these battles, Muslims are usually at a three to one disadvantage. How 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 close is that to maybe what was the actual number? We don't know, but we know that uh, the the Muslims were clearly outnumbered again. And 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 when when I post that map, when I show you that map, you'll see that there's a lot more people in this segment of the land than there are in this this place where the Muslims are uh, assembling. And so the Muslims come to know of this within about a week. That hey, uh, you're going to have a major coalition that's coming from Mecca 
that is uh, assembly, that's detaching units from the north. People are coming together. You have about a week to do something. So the Prophet ﷺ, again, goes to consultation. We see that the Prophet ﷺ did not necessarily lead holistically by just saying that, okay, I'm the Prophet of God. Here's what we're going to do. The Prophet ﷺ showed the truth of his prophethood by giving the agency to other people, by showing that he was just a human being, that he was open to hearing others' consultations. And what's very interesting is that the person who gave him this advice that would that would really give the name for this battle was a Persian, was Salman al-Farsi, who had given the idea that said, hey, I'm from the land of Faris. I'm from the land of Persia. From what I have come to know, when people are raiding us, when people are invading us, we dig moats. We dig a trench or a ditch or whatever you may call it uh, as a way to prevent people. We put uh, these different uh, sticks and whatnot, uh, these different stakes that are in the trench as a way to stop people from coming in, but we we do this this moat. This is a completely foreign idea that comes to uh, the Arabs. This is not something native to their land. And so through Salman al-Farsi, we see this important example of someone who's not an Arab. He's Again, we talked about how important it was for identity, for lineage, for tribal sake. In this case, he's someone who's not even an Arab. He's, a, he's someone from Persian, uh, per, from Persia, but we also see how uh, he gives he gives some hope when when we talk about uh, in our contemporary time how immigrants get the job done. He's an immigrant to Medina. He's an immigrant uh, to this land, and he gives an idea that really helps save this the city from its uh, from from an inevitable destruction at the hand of ten thousand people. What's really interesting is that it's not a holistic trench that goes all the way around. If you look at Medina and you just Google it, or you just look on it from uh, like Google uh, Google Earth, or just look at it from a maps perspective, you'll see it's surround. It has a unique topography. It's partially surrounded by mountain and volcano rock, and uh, parts of it are open. So there's certain parts that are open. So the trench was only to be dug around those open parts, and the rest would be covered because you can't really ride a uh, a a horse up those up those mountains or up the, that volcanic rock. It's just such in a way that it's not it's not uh, conducive for human feet or for animals. So. Some lessons that come for us for this is that the Prophet ﷺ not just is open to this uh, this advice of other people, but he is not limiting his advice to just those people who he's familiar with. He takes the advice of someone who is uh, who is not an Arab, someone who's come from a different land. We take that to our time now when we have mosques, when we have institutions, and we sometimes just trust ourselves, like only the Pakistanis will do this, or only the Arabs will do this, or only certain the Americans will do this, or whatnot. We have we consolidate ourselves like this, but but we, we don't care to sometimes think about what do other people have to say. And this was part and parcel, uh, a part of the Prophet Sallam's way of governance in terms of opening his consultation, allowing people to speak, even if sometimes that opinion would not be fruitful. If that opinion would be something that would lead to their downfall, he still gave them that space and honored that. And in digging the trench, we see that this was not just something the Prophet ﷺ said, hey, great idea, Salman, go do it for us. And a lot of times we have that in our society where it's like, hey, you had a great idea. Why don't you go lead the way you go do it? Salman probably showed them how to dig the trench, but it's so amazing that this was a full community effort that came together, men, women, and children helping each other out. And it's so interesting because we talk about the, uh, we've talked about this element of trauma that, that the Muslim community, the men, women, and children have faced in the loss that, that occurs, but also just the, the stinging loss of not being at home. Many of these people aren't, this isn't their home. Many of people have lost so many people in their own homes. And so uh, we see a way of traumatic healing is to do something conducive for the community, to do something conducive individually. So when you're participating as part of a group in an activity that helps to keep your thoughts at the present, keep your thoughts at the future and not just dwell so much on the past. There's a way of traumatic healing that's there. And in this, in incorporating everybody, not just saying, hey, women stay home, it's hot outside, uh, children stay over there, men will take care of this. We see a collective effort that even if uh, women were involved in different ways in terms of bringing food or, or drink or whatnot, and kids were also there helping to dig. And so we see not just that, that it wasn't a somber time. The men would sing. The Prophet ﷺ was there in the trenches digging with them, singing. They were singing these different uh, songs of praise that, that come there. So you have this imagery of, uh, of this collective identity. We, I, I mentioned earlier, before we started recording, I'd taken a road trip through the South and part of uh, 
the, the areas we'd gone through were, were some plantations. We'd done some ethical tours on a plantation and just seeing how in the margins, how uh, these communities of slaves would be able to not just sing together because it's like, hey, this is what we do to pass the time, but they would sing in a way that was that would give life. And these hymnals, these these uh, these spirituals that would be sung were ways of liberation, were ways of showing their devotion to God, were ways of connecting to one another. So there's a lot of power in that in that singing and in that song, and you see that being done at that time. And we see that not just that, but community dinners were made. Dinners were being made. People were coming in even if uh, rations were scarce. We see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam extending the invitations people gave him. They saw him, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, starving, him, him not having food, him not having drink and saying, hey, Prophet, come, 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 to, come get some drink, come get some food, we want to feed you. And he said, hey, I'm not coming unless you bring these people too. And he brings all these people who are digging with him. So you see this element of community really being fostered at this time. Lastly, uh, one thing we'll comment and then we'll close out, inshallah, uh, for the next time. The siege itself is about a month long. It's a month long. It doesn't have much action going on because, again, people come upon this trench. They're like, what is this? This is not an Arab device of war. And so they're stymied. They don't know what to do. So there's a lot of rather than arrow firing and just like, you know, invasion. There's a few of these small skirmishes that occur. But the large part defining characteristic of the Battle of the Trench is uh, tactics of deception. So on the Quraysh side, they try to go and uh, successfully persuade the tribe uh, Banu Quraiza, which is the last major Jewish tribe in the Medinan circle. They try to convince them to join, which they eventually are. They're very reluctant. We're going to talk about them and their psychology, inshallah, in the next session, but they're very reluctant. They eventually capitulate because they have an interesting opening to the south, and so they supply some weapons, and they pose a very internal threat to the Muslims. And on the other hand, you see, while these uh, while the Meccans are engaging in, in arrow fire and whatnot, the companions are forced to miss their prayers. They're forced to uh, have to delay their prayers and continue to put up a defense. And you see the Prophet ﷺ getting upset and, uh, and, and giving not so nice words to these people who have prevented him from praying. And so when we think about our prayers, we think about the what they were born in. We think about the tradition that they were born in, where the Prophet ﷺ would set aside time in battle to have prayer being done and how we view maybe prayer as a little bit more uh, something that we can just push to the side. Hey, it's not time for that yet. We can just push to the side. What value did they attribute to prayer? Not just that prayer was important, but there was something in prayer that they were getting out of it. They were getting something out of prayer that gave them that strength that they had to assign time for it. And lastly, uh, the, as I mentioned, the siege itself lasted just under a month, 25 days or so. You can tell that when they're out in just uh, in, in that area of Mecca, there's not a lot of, or in the area of Medina, there's not a lot of food, especially when uh, the Muslims have taken in much of the vegetation. The food starts to run low, patience starts to run low. The environment is not very forgiving, especially in the winter time. And so a storm starts to hit, different dust storms and whatnot. Eventually the Confederates, the Quraysh and everyone resolve to leave. That will leave us off today. Inshallah, we'll talk next time about what was the consequence that occurred after the Confederates had left, what was, uh, what was to come. And there's a very controversial event in the history of uh, early Islam concerning the execution of the Banu Quraiza, the people who were left there, uh, and, and how that uh, would, 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 would play into it. 